A very warm welcome back to the Celtic Exchange. We're here this afternoon to talk about your fourth book, I believe, uh, which is titled We've Got Magic, Stan and the King of Japan, Gordon Strachan's first season at Celtic. Matt, tell us a wee bit about the book and how it came to be, first of all. Yeah, it's nice to be back to you. Know, so, uh, yeah, this book is, uh, it's, it's been, I guess it's been a project in, in, in the background for a wee while now, but it's that, that particular era when uh, Gordon, I guess, came in on the back of uh, Martin and his success, I don't really feel it's been uh, really well documented, perhaps in, in in the past, and maybe maybe in the way it should have been. Uh, this, you know, the weirdest of situations in terms of you know how Gordon arrived at Celtic Park in a time of massive change. So uh, I felt it was it's quite a remarkable period. Typical Celtic theatre, real roller coaster of, of of highs and lows. Ultimately, more highs than lows. So. I just felt it was time to, to tell that particular story. Yeah, absolutely. Just before we get into it in, in great detail, so I've mentioned it's your fourth book. I believe it's your third solo project behind The Invincible Story, the story of Brendan Rodgers' 2016-17 season. There's then the Harry Hood book, uh, a man who scored over 125 goals for Celtic in the, the post-Lisbon era. And you also co-authored Walfred and the Bold Boys, the story of Celtic's early years. So uh, I believe you're now formally in retirement, but busier now than ever. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty much the case. It's the uh, it's the third solo book, as you say, we had the collaboration back on in Celtic's first season. So, yeah, retirement seems along with that. That that, that was a plan. It hasn't really quite uh, planned out that way. Busy, busy than ever, as you say, it, you know. Yeah, um, you've touched on it there just in your your opening words, but the the story of Gordon Strachan's era at Celtic, I, I very much believe it is. It's the it's a story less told, and I suppose just quite a straightforward, pointed question. Why is that? Why why is why is Gordon Strachan not as revered as Brendan Rodgers first time round? Even Lenny it spells Martin O'Neill, soon to be Ange. All, all these guys have got great status in the modern era. Why is Gordon Strachan less revered? I think there's a you know it's a, it's a great question. I think there's a number of answers to that. One is how on earth do you follow Martin O'Neill? I guess even even at my age, uh, the, the, that Martin O'Neill era, first four years in particular, you know there's that that's the real high. You'd fall in Celtic. Never thought I'd see a European final. Never thought. I'd, you know, being in Seville with my kids, watching Celtic, you know, vying at the very, very top level. So I think one one thing is, uh, how do you follow that? I think that's absolutely true. Another one is perhaps Gordon's background. So guys of my vintage will remember will remember Gordon, uh, no Celtic background whatsoever. In fact, you could argue it was the opposite. Gordon was a, a hugely successful player at uh, Aberdeen, the, the best Aberdeen side of all time, who were really dominant, one of the best sides in Europe at the time. And he wasn't averse to, uh, he wasn't averse to, uh, winding up the Celtic fans at time, uh, many a time will be up in that beach end as uh, you know Gordon's battering a penalty and you know giving us a you know giving us a wink or a wave or whatever. So as part of that, he, he didn't come through the traditional Celtic management route of having you know a real rapport with, with the fans and the club. So I, I think part of that reticence, if you like, with the fans was down to Gordon's background combined with falling on the back of Martin O'Neill in the Larson area, you know, you know a period of incredible success. So. I do think Gordon was a casualty in both those. There's possibly other reasons, but those are probably the, the two that spring to mind. Yeah, I remember when Liam Brady got the job and there was a lot of chat about, well, he's never played for Celtic, he, he doesn't understand. And we've come a long way since that, and rightfully so. I mean, most recently you had Ange Postacoglu, who he's for the other side of the world, let, you know, let alone having been a fan. So guys that are non-Celtic can be a success, but, you know, Gordon Strachan very much fits into that. that but you would say he's non-Celtic initially. And there's a famous line, we'll maybe get to later in the piece, something akin to... I never arrived a Celtic fan, but now I'll always be a Celtic fan. Something like that. Um, just in terms of the, this as a project, Matt. So your first book was Invincible, you know, recent history, 2016-17. You've then gone back to the 70s for Harry Hood's story. And even further back when you co-authored Walford and the Bold Boys, um, you know, Celtic's early years. What made you decide this as a project? I'm sure there's, as an author, you know, as a Celtic author, there's so many routes and avenues and stories to explore. Why did you land on this one with, with Gordon? Yeah, as I say, you're right, every one of those books has got their own wee story behind it and, and why you did it. In this particular case, sort of mentioned earlier, it's more, it's the, the story never told. Uh, very, very relevant to I mean, the, the, even the Japanese angle at the minute with some of the wonderful players we've got now. I'm a huge fan, I'm conscious we'll come on to that later, but Nakamura, my goodness, what an absolute genius, probably the best debut I've ever seen of any Celtic player. Lit the place up, still technically perfect. A, a man who was putting the free kicks through bus, open bus windows for a laugh and probably scored. In fact, I'm going to remove the probably, I'll be contentious here. Scored for me the greatest Celtic goal I have ever seen live. Free kick against Manchester United, technically perfect, 35, 40 yards out. He's placing that ball. 
Six foot seventeen Dutch international goalkeeper, no right to score it. Puts the ball in the corner, and I, I maintain to this day, if we still had if we'd had VAR then, and the referee had rolled it out for retake, he'd have done it again. So Nakamura, real hero of mine. The kids used to laugh at me because I would celebrate a touch rather than the goal. I remember one time at Paisley, I think it was the, he pulled the ball down with the outside his boot and then cut inside the defender before he scored the goal. I'm up celebrating the goal, so the kids. The kids never let me forget that. but So it was an era where there's so many great characters and it's just, I said, it's probably not been covered. We've, we've read about Seville, you know, we've, we've written about Billy McNeil's era and, you know, Joke Steen's era, Brendan's era. I just felt it's time for Gordon's story. Gordon, maybe for me, a bit of a, a an unheralded hero. And I just felt it was maybe time to try and do my bit about putting that right, if that makes any kind of sense. M- makes a lot of sense and, and I think you're bang on. Just talking about Nakamura, I always think of that goal against Rangers. The night we won 2-1 with Jan Venegur scoring the late, late kind of diving header. But Nakamura opens the scoring from about 35, 40 yards with this kind of swerve and dip and volley. And that's just what I think of when I see him. But there's so many magic moments. The maddest thing is, he just retired last year. I think at 44 years of age, he was playing for Yokohama FC and he's only just hung up the boots. Now, I'm 42, Matt. So I'm thinking I've got a couple of years to maybe still make it. I think you've got at least that. <laughs> In fact, I was, looking, I was checking the boots out this morning myself and I'm a wee bit, I'm, I'm, I'm a couple of years old. I think you were the year below me at school for memory, Tino. Exactly. Um, but no, so many big figures. Obviously, you know, the, the title, Magic Stan, the King of Japan, that's just three, but there's so many characters that tell the story of that season and that era uh, for Gordon Strachan. And we'll get to all that just shortly. Um, you have mentioned the, the challenges that Gordon faced immediately on coming in the door. Uh, following the footsteps of Martin O'Neill, no easy task. Arguably the you know, the man who kicked off the modern Celtic and you know certainly potentially one of the most successful managers of, of that era, of the modern era. Uh, I hate to bring it up, Matt, there's Black Sunday. Uh, and you go into that in some detail in the book, which is upsetting. You know, I've read the manuscript <laughs> as, as part of uh, prep for this one. It's a tough old read at that part because Black Sunday, you know, being when Celtic blew the league on the, the last day of 2004 season, Losing to Motherwell, Scott McDonald's goals. And that in itself was such a tough time. And Gordon Strachan's first task was to pick up that squad and, and pick up where that left off. There's also the fact that Celtic were coming to terms with a, a post Henrik Larsson era. Uh, he obviously had retired the year before in 2004, but you know Celtic were still coming to, to terms with that as, as a club, let alone you know a team on the park. And we'd lost other big figures, guys like Sutton, Lambert, McNamara, Joss Valhalla, they all left on a free at that time. And he had to try and rebuild things with a fraction of the budget. It's very well spoken of, isn't it? That as successful as Martin O'Neill was, Martin had big budgets. You know, he spent big on Lenny, Hartson, Suttons, whereas Gordon Strachan had a, a fraction of the budget. Um, so all the more remarkable then that he went on to achieve exactly what he did for Celtic. Yeah, I think it's what on team. That's an incredible achievement. And, and if you think uh, if you think reading the chapter in Black Sunday was tough, you should have tried writing it. I think I was just about in tears. Uh, one of the worst days of my life, and, 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 there, and there have been a few. But uh, quite hard. And the other thing as well, to slip in, like the, the seven days after Black Sunday, we had Martin's last game with that surreal Scottish Cup final where we knew, we all knew that Martin was leaving. We'd lost the league. We won the cup. Sort of felt a bit empty to say the least because Martin was obviously dealing with some, some real serious uh, family issues and, and left for that reason. So, yeah, it's, it's hard to remember a time where the Celtic support was so flat. And then I, I try to reflect that in the chapter. But equally, I guess night is dark, it's just before the dawn. I think without without those real lows, you mentioned Bratislava, the, the B word, we'll probably come on to the, the two B words shortly. But without w- without that without that low, maybe you don't maybe you don't enjoy the high so much. And how Gordon and the squad turned that round in twelve months, it's it's a remarkable story. Maybe remarkable as well that it's not been told by now before now. But uh, I certainly hope that hopefully now it's out there. And as I say, his, history is a history is a habit of being kind. I'll, I'll always maintain. You mentioned the first book, Invincible. I still think with every passing year, the invincible achievement becomes a bit more, you know, it becomes a bit a bit greater, doesn't it? Even at the time, because we were, you know, blowing the opposition away at the time. But as every year goes on, you see how easy, uh, Kilmarnock a couple of weeks ago, you see how fragile, particularly in cup competitions, it is. So I, I say, just it's time that story was told. I've came for the absolute pits of despair, personally, and, you know, on on the pitch, trophy wise, teams, you see a lot of big, a lot of big characters leaving or had left or were in the final throw as you mentioned Chris Sutton with, with a few months more guys like Chris Sutton and Didier Agath but uh, the final season for John Hartson for Stan Petrov and these guys Gordon's mixing a new team with some of these I guess Seville legends and to come through all of that 
with the budgetary, I guess, who knows what the constraints were, but certainly the general consensus seems to be he was getting the wage bill at the same time and expecting to win trophies. It's a remarkable achievement, it really is. Yeah, and it was a real challenge to do so. Yeah. Um, You've mentioned the two Bs, so that's Bratislava <laughs> and Broadwood, and, and we'll definitely get to them. Just, just before we move on from, from Black Sunday, and from here on in, it will never be spoken about again, Mike, <laughs> you'll be glad to hear, but uh, you've mentioned yourself that you personally are, are quote-unquote ridiculously superstitious, and how does that play out for you? Just in general, have you got Celtic rituals, things you do, tops you wear, uh, you know, approaches, how, how does that play out for you as a guy? Right, look, look, there's some answers to that that I could possibly say on air. But yeah, as ridiculous as, as the word, I'm incredibly superstitious. I'll never make a score prediction. Certain strips have to be worn. I'm still wearing like, you know, the strip for two seasons ago, and I'll wear that until we, we have a big loss. But uh, there's a number of things in that Black Sunday, and without, without, I guess, spoiling the book, in terms of not, not getting a ticket for the match and watching it not in a regular pub, seeing Motherwell turning up in black, married by, uh, managed by Terry Butcher. And just a whole lot of things. See when you you, know, when you start to recall Mick through, you thought all the signs were there, and it was they just we lost the game in the last day of the season. It was like we literally lost it in the last minute of the season. So, oh, a quite a quite horrendous day. I mean, there's one thing I, I will share, and it was it was in a pub in Mulgay watching the game. They'd basically the two pubs in Mulgay. They dedicated one to Celtic, one to Rangers, over at Easter Road, and uh, and I was in. They gave Rangers the pub we would normally be in, so right away that was that was a black mark. But I remember saying to my wife to come and pick me up, I was going for a couple of beers, watch the game, and uh, I never forget to this day that uh, after the game, sitting absolutely frozen, shell shocked, and I'm I'm standing at the bar just trying to take in what's just happened, and it's a huge plate glass window right hand side, and I see my wife approaching, and she just took one look into the pub and kept walking. And I think that she just took one look and kept walking, and that was that was it. I really, really struggled. I, like, I guess majority, if not all, Celtic supporters. That was a really, really sore one for so many reasons. And then to say the following week, despite winning the cup, or saying goodbye to you know that, saying goodbye to an era, and and bringing in a real uncertain new era. And Gordon came in without you see that Celtic was you're only bringing Billy McNeil in, you were bringing a guy in who had no connection with Celtic whatsoever. Had worked at clubs in England with success, but. Not the kind of clubs, you know, not clubs who were chasing trophies. So there was a lot of things, you know, where are we going from now? It was pretty obvious that some of the other guys were probably on their, their last legs, probably another, you know, maybe some for some it was a season too far. So time of great uncertainty and for Gordon to come in, grab that and turn it around. Quite incredible. Yeah. Just to close the chapter on the Martin O'Neill era, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but I think you summed it up nicely by saying, listen, Black Sunday, horrendous time. Losing the league in the 2003 season when we played Kilmarnock as well as obviously not winning in Seville. If you get told that the Martin O'Neill package would contain everything that contained all the success, all the glory and those, you know, significant but, you know, few failings, you would have taken it all day long. And I think that's fair to say, isn't it? Absolutely. Every day of the week. Yeah. Um, the foreword for the book is written by Lenny, which which is nice to see. And, uh, you know, I think there's a bigger picture with Lenny at the moment that he absolutely deserves his place in Celtic's, you know, you know, rich history and the the failed ten in a row season seems to have clouded that. And I'd like to think, and I'm confident as well, that Neil Lennon will be afforded his his very welcome place in Celtic's history moving forward. But great to have Lenny uh, right in the forward and it's, it's very well put together as well by him, isn't it? Uh, it is indeed. And I love that point about Neil Lennon because obviously we're all hurting desperately after the, you know, after after his final season. But I was at a, at a doing Celtic Park maybe last April. It was for the Willie Mealy statue that the, the boys uh, erected in, in Newry in, in Mealy's hometown and Martin O'Neill was a guest that night and I loved it we were at a table that night we were tuning away and they mentioned Neil Lennon's name and somebody in the crowd people have their own opinion I totally get that somebody in the crowd started booing and Martin O'Neill fair play to him a hall of several hundred people Martin O'Neill said I think you should ref- I think you should reflect on Neil Lennon's entire I guess tenure at Celtic, his career as a player and as a manager, having achieved rather than one season. For, what I would add to that is some of the stuff that Neil had to put away off the park as well, and 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 you know he didn't walk away. So yeah, I get the hurt and disappointed point, and absolutely I was there. But yeah, yeah, Neil Lennon, Celtic, Celtic star, Celtic legend, and and absolutely worthy of his place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, at the start of the book, Matt, and, and very important to you, um, and understandably so, is a dedication to David Potter. David, you know, fellow Celtic author and friend of yours who sadly died just a short couple of months ago at the end of July. And how important has David been to you as a friend and fellow author, you know, someone to, to bounce off of in terms of your own 
fairly early years, I suppose, as an author. Yep. And how important is he in the bigger picture to the you know the, the wider Celtic support in terms of what he's written? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, and I'm glad you man- glad you mentioned that. Well, David, David, even before became friends, between colleagues became friends. Uh, David, I guess, is, is a writer, is is one of you know the inspiration behind me doing any writing at all, anyway. So guys like David and, and you know Pat Woods, you know guys who've dedicated decades of to trying to make sure Celtic stories are shared, which I think is is, is a crucial. So yeah, David Potter is, is a writer, inspirational, historian, and so is a friend. Hilarious as well, and I say that I think I mentioned in a maybe in a previous interview. David is an unconscious comedian half the time. He would write the most serious of emails to you regarding what we were doing or projects or whatever, and then he'd have a one liner that just cut your legs off you. So I, I, I think we're all still trying to come to terms with uh, with David's loss because, as, as you know, it was entirely unexpected. He'd been ill and he was getting better, and he was talking about what he was going to do and whatever, and then bang. So, yeah, still come to terms with that. But one thing, Celtic were great. Celtic put uh, tribute on at half time. I don't know if you caught that on the screen and put words, something in the Celtic view recently. And that's, that was instigated by Celtic, not, not, not from our end. So it's nice to see. And I think David, David Potter, if there's ever a legacy, a Celtic legacy, my goodness, it's that one. Uh, 30 years of Celtic books covering, you, you mentioned I'm jumping around a bit in terms of periods, but that's what it's all about. It's, it's not a low hanging fruit all the time. It's, Sometimes it's stories that haven't been told and should be told, and David was wonderful at that. Alec McNair, single-handedly, you, we talked, I think, before about Icicle, single-handedly put a guy on the map who should never have been off the map, but 100 years ago, you know, Alec McNair, you know, more games than anyone else, older than anyone else, a fantastic Celtic career. For me, David put him on the map, so he's got a legacy of, of written work uh, that will stand the test of time forever, and, my goodness, that's that's a legacy to be proud of. Yeah, I, th- I think it's something like 34, 35 books and uh, an absolute inspiration. I know he is to yourself, Matt, and, and obviously just he was a very good friend, first and foremost. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read the dedication. So it just says, dedicated, dedicated to the memory of David Potter, who now takes his own richly deserved place in the story of his beloved Stel- Celtic. A wonderful historian, an inspirational author and teacher, and a dear friend who will be hugely missed. So great to see the the dedication to David at the very start of this book, Matt. Um, Moving on to the story itself, you know, and and we've touched on, of course, the challenges that Gordon Strachan faced. The worst possible start, the the worst possible start to his Celtic career. A 5 0 loss to Armitia at Media Bratislava in his first competitive game. How, how do you come back from that? I don't know, and I have, I have to admit, on the night itself, watched it on the TV, I, I couldn't see him survive until the weekend. Crazy as that sounds, it was, it was just the most, it was just the most awful night. Well, I think everything that could go wrong just decided that that's exactly what it was going to, it was going to do. Celtic missed some wonderful chances. So, seen a game the other night with Bayern Munich and Manchester United that finished four three. Bratislava could have been like that. One of the goals is a world day, but most of them were it was two fullbacks playing, you know, together for the first time. And Chris Sutton, I think, fractured his cheek within about twenty minutes. We missed pretty much two open goals, and Gordon, rather than you know showing things up at two 0 decided no, that it's still away goals at a time. No, we'll get a goal. We'll, we'll beat this lot at home, and he, he went for it. And then, of course, right, at, you know, right at the death, we lose a fifth goal. So, worst European result ever. I remember Neuchatel. That was bad enough. At least we get a goal. But this was, you know, for me, this was worse. And then, of course, there's the remarkable thing that six days later, you go to Celtic Park and, for, you know, if that game was played another nine times, Celtic would have Celtic would have beaten them. We, as it was, we scored four in the night, missed another barrel load of chances. And uh, no team has ever come back, pretty sure I'm right in saying that, no team has ever come back from a five-goal deficit to win in Europe. Celtic, Celtic should have done it that night, no question. So how do you come back for that? I don't know, but we're probably just about to find out. <laughs> we very much will. Uh, yeah, so it was a chance to make history by being the first side to overturn yeah. such a, a first leg scoreline. Uh, we fall short, we win 4-0 in the night. Goals from Thompson, Hartson, McManus uh, and Craig Beatty, but so near yet so far. You mentioned now Chatel Zamax, I, I remember that well, Liam Brady time, wasn't it? Yes. Hoss- Hossan Hassan, Spot on. The, yeah. the striker. Yeah. Um, so you think that's a shock, but at least you get a goal that night. This time it's it's 5-0. There's a great quote from Strachan. Great, is that the right word? There's a quote from Strachan. So he said, you know, so disappointed and effective, affected was he by the result at the time. Around about a year later, and obviously you know, lots of success followed, but a year later he was quoted as saying, when I die, I reckon the inscription on my headstone should read, this is much better than Bratislava. You know, you know the, the, the sweet sanctuary of death was better than, than what he experienced there. And, you know, he's a humorous guy, you know, he's, there's a lot of kind of quotes and, and quips, you know, from Gordon Strachan, but 
you can see, and there's other quotes doing the rounds, you can see just how badly it affected him. And I actually think it possibly still does. I have no doubt. It's a, it's a brilliant quote again, like you. I don't know if brilliant's the right word for it. When I, when I read that quote, I burst out laughing because that, that is it. That's how, I think that's how we all felt. But poor Gordon had to bear the brunt of his manager in his first game. Yeah, so, wow. Well, uh, yeah. Um, obviously, he does, you know, recover from that and, and we yeah. get into it in a lot of detail. There's so many key games from that season, Matt. Um, listen, there's Celtic stories, there's seasons in Celtic's rich history that are just nothing but up, up and up. You know, success after success, trebles and different things. You know, famous years, the invincible season you've written about, 67 years where everything Celtic touched, you know, went gold. This was not that season. This this is real roller coaster stuff. You lose to Art Media and you're you know you're under the cosh already. You lose the first old firm game of the season, 3 1 at Ibrooks. Um there's various things going on, but things do start to turn Celtic win the return, uh, 3 0 in November. After I think uh, also winning the League Cup game against Rangers early in that uh, that month, so also November 2 0 victory. So things are starting to turn, but then inexplicably Celtic follow up a win against Rangers with a 1 0 home defeat to Dunfermline at Celtic Park. What's going on? I don't know, it's difficult to comprehend, but, but you're right, losing at Ibrox, and, and it was a, I guess, it's a classic Ibrox encounter for Celtic. We've, we've all been there a million times. We, we finished with nine men. You know, there's, there's penalty decisions that go, maybe, perhaps don't go our way. So, on the back on the back of Bratislava, losing losing that game, that's sore. But then, I guess, that spirit comes through. And the, the two game, the two victories in 10 days, that was, there was a couple of, piv- for me, there was a couple of pivotal Moments in the season. It, it, I was going to use the word anomaly for Dunfermline, but uh, I, I need to bite my lip uh, after recent comments with that. But the two victories over Rangers were crucial because it effectively didn't quite end the season. There's still the Scottish Cup, but it's, it effectively knocked them out of two tournaments. At that time, even as early as that, Hearts were flying. They they, they were they were under Burley, George Burley. They were they were doing really well. They came to Celtic Park and got away with a draw. They were doing really well, and then bizarrely, they decided to sack the manager. And it was a, you know, the, the Russian chap that came in, Romanov, yeah. Romanov came in and decided whatever was going on there to sack the manager and that sort of derailed hearts. But in the meantime, Celtic still had work to do. The two games, the previous season, we'd played Rangers, very similar, uh, the League Cup and League, and, and we'd lost both those games from memory. But this time, both were at Celtic Park and the difference. Sean Maloney scores an incredible goal that night. That was another, you mentioned some of the great characters there. Sean Maloney, who'd been part of Martin O'Neill's team, but as a, I guess as a young lad, I remember coming on at Ibrox in the, the day that Henry scored the, 50, the 50th goals. But Sean Maloney really came through that season. He was a young player of the year and the player of the year. And that, that night, he scored an, you mentioned Nacker's goal the following season. Uh, Sean Maloney scored a real well day that night as well. Just drifted in, picked it up at the top corner. And I think... By that time, Celtic were still were starting to, you know, from a, I get a relatively slow start. They were starting to put wins together. They were starting to they looked like a side. But you know, Magic Zarafsky had come in. Uh, as I say, Nakamura was coming in, light, lighting the place up. Gordon was starting to put his mark in the team. Fans were starting to, you know, turn round, starting to believe again. It was a slow, slow process, as we mentioned earlier. But the Dunfermline one always put down a bit of anomaly. That sometimes it happens. We've been there. It's a real high of winning those two games, and all of a sudden you've got the game where it should be the home banker and. If you memory, we missed a barrel of chances that day, but I put that down as no more an anomaly. The two wins, two wins over Rangers were critical in the overall context of the season for me. Yeah, and what about the game, which which I feel was just the kind of seminal moment? Is that too dramatic of the season? It's the it's the New Year's Day game against yeah. Hearts. It's at Tynecastle. I think so many folk will remember. I remember it vividly. I watched it in a pub called Jack's in a place called Gudor in Donegal. Um, yeah. I was there with a few mates and. You go 2 0 down after less than 10 minutes. I think, is it Presley and uh, Paul Hartley? It was. Two future Celts. Uh, one more popular than the other. Um, well, man. And Celtic are struggling big time in the game. And then there's a couple of things happen that, that really make a difference. Stephen Pearson coming off and, yes. and injecting just a bit of energy and getting a goal back. And then this was the time where Steve McManus really stepped up. You know, he'd, he'd broke through, he'd played a bit of you know, football under Martin O'Neill, but this was his moment and he scores two. Late, late goals to completely turn it around. It's a 3-2 win. As you've mentioned, Matt Hearts ended up being the, our biggest rivals you know, during that season. But just how important was that game and, and what's your own recollections of it? Yeah, it was, it was hugely important and I've, I've got so many recollections. You know, right, I talked about Sean Maloney. It's uh, quite a breakthrough season because obviously Sean played against Stuttgart and Rotis Phil. But certainly for Steve McManus it was. He came in, I think, in the Motherwell game in the back of Bratislava and pretty much never left. Became the captain of Celtic a few years later. But you, you were in Guido, you were... Paddy Warner country, the sounds. I was over. I was down south. My wife's from Wales, 
I was down, we were, it was New Year's Day, as you said, we were down, we were down in Wales, Wales Fathers from Hyde, so they're all uh, Manchester United fans. Anyway, long story short, we went to a, a pub in, in North Wales to watch the game, and as you're right, we've hardly, we've hardly sat down with a pint, it's two goals down, and I'm getting pelters from the brother-in-laws and the, and the rest of the group, Liverpool fans and whatever, and of course, Bravado kicks in, uh, a couple of beers, no, no, Celtic's going to do this, no chance, Celtic's going to do this. Do I really believe it? I don't know. Wish, wishful thinking. Then I think it's Stan Petrov that gets up, as you say. Pearson comes on, we get a goal in the second half. There's another wee side story as well before I forget. Roy Keane sitting in the stand. Okay, we've just signed Roy Keane. Absolute hero to me. Couldn't you believe it? We got Roy Keane in December. And then uh, I guess shades of uh, George Cadetti. Uh, he wasn't allowed, he didn't open the offices to allow uh, Roy Keane to play that day. So a game that would have been tailor made for Keane. And that has consequences if we're going to talk about the other B word. Anyway, Roy Keane's in the stand. I'm down here, two goals down, getting dogs abuse. But he's still with that bravado. And I remember Pearson scores. And then, as you say, we're getting to, I don't know, maybe three minutes to go. And big Steve McManus pops up. Uh, he, scored a goal. he scored a couple of goals that season, but he popped up with that vital goal. And at that point, I'm declaring to all and sundry, we're winning this. We're absolutely winning this. There's only about 90 seconds to go, and that's what happened. It's incredible, I get, I get into so much trouble because we then had a few beers to celebrate, and pretty late getting back, dinner was burned, all the usual. But uh, it's a day I'll never, I'll never forget. And then I think a couple of days later, we're travelling back up for the game was on at Broadwood. But that's a very different story. Very different. Uh, and let's just crack on with it. So, yeah, an amazing day at Tyne Castle. Uh, huge moment for Steve Manis. I, I think I'd mentioned, Matt, I went, went to school, I went to Holy Cross in Hamilton, and Steve was ah. a couple of years below me. Played some boys' club, club stuff with them over the years. And a really good lad from a really good family and stuff. And it was great to see someone that you had some sort of connection with going yep. and, and doing something for Celtic. And he, uh, there's a great pictures of him celebrating right in front of the Celtic fans there. So huge moment for Stephen, huge moment for you know the season and, yep. and huge for Gordon Strachan. But yes, we, we then go to Broadwood uh, less than a week or so later, something like that. Um, it's the Scottish Cup. It's Roy Keane's debut. Yes. It's Dewey's debut. Yes. <laughs> the Chinese loanee, and I think that was his first and last 45 minutes for Celtic. Yeah. What I think is also, there's a serious Celtic link in the game that Joe Miller, who was a co-manager of uh, Clyde at the time, he comes off the bench 17 years after scoring the winner in the 1989 final. So there's, there's all sorts of links there. But ultimately, the only thing that matters is that Celtic lost the game and, and how could that possibly have come to be? You know, good Celtic side on a high after the Hearts win. How do you then go and lose at Broadwood? I know, it's incredible. It, it, it really is. And again, so many so many reasons for that. And when you look back now, it was absolutely an accident waiting to happen. First thing is Broadwood, with Broad, either Broadwood was frozen up beforehand and he picked the team and by the time the game came round, it was a mud bath or, or vice versa. Anyway, Gordon, Gordon picked the team. I always... I was always curious why Roy Keane played that game. It never felt to me. Tynecastle, as I said earlier, I think Tynecastle been tailor made for for Keane to make his debut. I felt Broadwood was probably not the call. But as I say, we don't always know what's gone behind the scenes. There was injuries and whatever. Do we again? Strange, strange place for me to introduce a man who'd played no football whatsoever. So I'm guessing there was some kind of needs much there. And you're right, he played two games that day. He's first and his last. And the strange thing, as I say, I managed to get all the way up the road without hearing the score. I watched the game, you know, on delay, recorded. I literally could not believe my eyes because it could have it finished, it finished 2-1. I think Magic scored a goal late on. Even at that point, we're still thinking we're going to put one back. But it could have been five. They seemed to be running through as it will. It was one of those days where, again, a bit like, it's, straight, it's unusual to get a Bratislava. It's unusual to get a Broadwood, to get two of them in the same season in cup ties where you have no comeback, really. And I know be the second leg at Europe, but five nothing down, you're up against it. But, to have the two of them in the same season, it's, it's, it's just it's quite quite bizarre. Uh, Gordon, in trying to explain it, I think talked about the conditions. He picked a team we won, set of conditions in mind, and when we actually got there, it was different. And I hadn't picked up in the link to, to just a brilliant link to Joe Miller in the, the cup final. I always like it's always the other guy I remember, uh, Graham Roberts. So yeah. many years earlier, I'd been at Ibrox as a as, a, as, a, as a conducted the choir. I'll probably just leave that one at that. So so, so Joe coming on. Although I think the damage was done. It was done long before. There were two goals ahead and we half time. He had to change something, which he, which he did. And we did get a goal back. A wee bit too little too late. It's another one of those where had you know, had we salvaged the had got a late goal in the replay you don't have any fears looking through. But Clyde I think then lost to Gretna. It was definitely the year of the underdog. Our media did well in Europe. They get into the group stages and they you know, they Master a few points there as well. So they were no mugs as well. Clyde I think we were beating the Gretna and Gretna went all the way to the final, so yeah, just one of those things, but the, the strangest, strangest of games. And just looking across the course of that season, though, so 
Strachan survives that loss to Media. <laughs> then he loses the first Old Firm game. Then he loses 1-0 at home to Dunfermline, which is kind of unthinkable when you reflect back on it. And an exit in the third round of the Scottish Cup to Clyde. And still goes on to be a huge success. It's, I suppose from Gordon Strachan's point of view, it shows incredible resilience, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The real strength of character in the part of Gordon and also the, this group of players, which bear in mind we're really coming together. You've got the residue of Martin's team, which by and large, by by Christmas, you know, you're, you're down to your, your Stan Petrovs, Bobo Baldy, you're really down to bare bones. And it's another team knitting together, none of whom really, weren't it? Gordon would latterly go on, you mentioned, he would latterly go and bring players in from Hibs and from Hearts and whatever. But at that time, the guys that were coming, it was Arthur Boric, you know, the holy goalie, you know, Magic Zirafsky, he was bringing players in, Cam- Kamara, you know, from Burnley, uh, uh, sorry, Adam Virgo, another guy didn't didn't feature that much, Paul Telfer, another, I guess, maybe un- unheralded man. I loved it, Nakamura used to, there used to be a saying that Paul Telfer would run 50 yards just so Nak- he could buy Nakamura uh, you know, five feet, yep. and that was all Mac Nakamura needed. And there's a cracking picture in the book, and it's exactly Naka's looking up as he did, perfectly poised, waiting to pick his pass. And in the background, there's Telfer bursting a gut to get down. Another one of these guys that maybe supporters maybe took a wee time to take to, but a player's player. So, also, there's Gordon's spirit of character, and also the character of these players to bounce back. In those circumstances, and still deliver trophies. It's it's quite it's quite a remark. I keep going back. It's quite a remarkable season. A roller coaster, Celtic theatre, all of these things. But ultimately, a successful season. And I'd like it to be remembered for that. Absolutely, and we'll get into some of the big characters uh, just shortly. I, I like what you've said there about Paul Telfer because he, he won't be anybody's Celtic hero. He won't be on the back of anybody's shirts, as far as I know. But he's the kind of player that you need in your team. I actually liken him right now to to Liam Scales, and what I mean by that is. Just an honest professional trying to get the best of what talent he has. You know, Paul Telfer will never be a Nakamura. He won't have the skill of him or anybody even close to him. But all he can do is give his all with the the talent he has. And I think that's what Liam Scales is doing right now. If everybody's fit and available, Liam Scales probably doesn't feature for Celtic. He probably finds himself back at Aberdeen. But all he can do is give the best of himself. And I think that's exactly what he's doing. And I think that's why he's getting now starting to get a wee bit of credit, Liam Scales. And I think Paul Telfer and others like him deserve the credit as well. And Nakamura might be one of the first to mention the, the work that he put in yeah. off the ball. A player's player, as you say, and I'm sure a great teammate. You also mentioned Celtic Theatre, and, and this season absolutely falls into it. And it leads us nicely to the, the next kind of key game of the season. It's the League Cup win over Dunfermline. It's on the 19th of March, 2006. Forever now known as the, the Jimmy Johnson final after Jimmy sadly passed on the 13th of uh, the same month, so just six days prior. And all the players uh, on the day were wearing the number seven on their shorts. So tell us a bit more about that game, Matt. Yeah, I mean, what, what an emotional day that was. Where, where, do you, where do you start with Jimmy Johnson? I, you know, I, I do the tours. Like often we talk, when we get around to talking about you know Lisbon and Jimmy. I often make the point, I often make the comment that you could do a tour on Jimmy himself. Quite an incredible character. So uh, genius on the park. Obviously, he had his, his his illness, a dreadful illness, he had to contest with. He contested with that. For me, he dealt with that with the same sort of bravery. I liked a lot of the lines. I've said some similar things. He dealt with that with the same kind of bravery and courage he showed on the park. But ultimately, uh, he, he succumbed. Still, only ages with me. Quite, quite, I, I, you know, quite hard to get your head round. But typical Celtic theatre. Few, you know, a few days after Jimmy passes, and we'll get you. Know, you've got the you get a Hamden final, and there's a real, a real poignant photo of the team lining up with the with the white tracksuit tops with with Johnson and the number seven. Real. You know, absolutely fabulous picture. And of course, the the, the game kicks off. It's Dunfermline, certain Alan McGregor in goal, which people might might not remember. But and who scores the first goal of the final? The number Celtic's current number seven. A bit like, you know, when when Big Joso scored in the sixty seventh minute after after Billy passed away. Number seven for Celtic scores a goal. So and then I guess the guy many us think of as the number seven in that team, Sean Maloney, steps up and curls the most immaculate uh, free kick home. So an immaculate day. Very significant as well. It's the first trophy for Gordon. So you, you've talked to a couple of times. There's the there's a European. There was no safety net European cup. And that was another legacy of Black Sunday, because we lost that goal in the last minute. We had to qualify for the Champions League. So hence we got Bratislava. So Gordon really he, he didn't. He wasn't dealt the, the, the best of cards. Was he the best of hands? And obviously the Clyde one. There's no comeback for there. But to win that League Cup and I think Gordon made a great point as well. That Celtic to win to win the trophy, Celtic had to beat four top flight sides, including of course Rangers in there. So it wasn't you know, sometimes you can have an easier path than others. 
Gordon Strachan's party, that first trophy for the League Cup, was, was, not, a, was not an easy one. Some big teams in there and a very emotional uh, afternoon where we could remember. And a couple of days, of course, later, we had Jimmy making his final trip past the, you know, via Paradise. So, yeah, very, very, very emotional time. Partly yeah. invincible as we lost Tommy. It's strange how these first seasons we lost yeah. so many. I don't know. Very much so, and, points. and very much a fit and tribute for Jimmy Johnson. And you know, just I've seen the image you talk about; it's such a striking image, isn't it? Um, you mentioned the goal scorers, and there's, there's certainly the link between Zeravsky, you know, number seven, Maloney, yep, you know, and everything but number. He, he's number seven. You've also forgot to mention Dion Dublin, who I think is the was the same age that you are now when he scored the goal to clinch it as well. You know, short lived time in the hoops, but an honest player, and I suppose. A guy that Gordon Strachan brought in because he knows and trusts him, same as same as yes. Paul Telfer. I think he might have had him at Coventry, um, but he, he didn't feature much. But he'll always have that goal on his record as well. So, and I'm sure, I mean, he's busy doing homes under the hammer and whatever else he does these days. But he'll reflect back on that's a bit of an Indian summer for a guy like Dion Dublin. You know, he'd, he'd had his career down south, and all of a sudden he finds himself not only just at Celtic, but playing and scoring in a, a cup final at Hamden, and just that all adds to the theatre of things, doesn't it? No, it does. First, I'm going to absolutely take that compliment every day of the week. Yeah, Dion was exactly the same age as I am now when he scored <laughs> the oldest player ever to to, to, to score in a cup final. So that's as well aware anyway. And again, we had to we had to include that if he's, if he's not making up inventing musical instruments or whatever, as you say, home under the hammer, what a character he was. So Dion gets his rightful place in the book. There's a cracking sort of picture sequence. Well, it's basically shows him slotting the ball and then celebrating after it. And that, he said himself after the game, you know, I won't play any more cup finals. And indeed, I think that was his last, pretty much his last involvement for Celtic. His last season in professional football. So that's not a bad way to sign off, is it? Yes, it's possibly the best way. Um, the, the the pinnacle of the season, Matt, of course, was clinching the league title. Um, huge for Gordon Strachan. As we, you know, we've already touched on the, the challenges, challenges that he faced. And to turn it all around, especially after his opening day, to then clinch the title and Celtic ultimately won the po- the league by 17 points yep. over Hearts um, and there's there's even more theatre on the night in question we beat Hearts 1-0 at Celtic Park a midweek game if I remember yes uh, 5th of April John Hartson scores the only goal on his birthday no less if I was if I was making if I was writing fiction that would be dismissed as too far fetched but you're spot on again by the time we came to play Hearts that we, we talked earlier about the New Year's Day game that was a must that was a must win game for Hearts if Hearts had won the races back on, but Celtic pretty much finished them, and then what they'd done over the, I guess the the, the succeeding weeks is that they just they kept edging that lead ahead. Hearts were, were dropping points, and Celtic were pretty much relentless. But uh, but yeah, so by the time we came there, it's, it's Celtic theatre again, isn't it? We're under the lights. Big John's birthday, and he scores an early goal, and it's a it's a it's an untypical, an atypical Hearts and goal perhaps. It's an atypical Celtic goal. It's a route one clearance, and John just hits the ball early. And it catches Craig Gordon, isn't it? He catches Craig Gordon off and it bounces in up at, up at the far side. And then the celebrations after that, just, there's nothing, there's something magical about Celtic part in the lights, aren't there? So, uh, yeah, it was a, a wonderful, I think by that time we knew we were going to win the league. But to do it with a wee bit of style and with so many games, really. And just, the other thing about John as well is earlier on that season, uh, Falkirk, uh, the Falkirk Stadium, he'd scored the 100th goal. So that's, that, that's a real elite club of, of players who have scored a century of goals for Celtic. And very fitting that John, who was obviously took on the mantle because Henrik had left, as you said earlier, Tino in 2004. Uh, Chris had had that injury in Bratislava and was probably playing out his career. He'd be he'd be Aston Villa, uh, so he'd be, sorry Aston Villa, Birmingham City. I can't remember which order by the by the new year. So John was really carrying that mantle of the senior striker. So I thought it was very appropriate that he scored the goal, that clinched the title, and to do it in his birthday. My goodness. If Carlsberg done birthdays, that, that would do me. What a moment for him. And, and yeah. you know, out with John Hartson, and you've touched on a few of them, or we've touched on a few of them already, yeah. there's so many big characters from that team. Yeah. Lenny was a captain, as mentioned, he, he wrote the forward. John Hartson, Alan Thompson, Aidan McGeady, you know, he yeah. doesn't, doesn't get mentioned a lot. Um, and then there's the title characters, of course, so Magic Zaravsky, Stan Petrov, the king of Japan being uh, yeah. Nakamura. And yes, Gordon Strachan had his challenges to overcome, but he had some big, big characters to help him do so. Yeah, he did. And then, you know, credit to, as I say, these guys were pulled in. They were not, I would challenge any Celtic supporter to say would they put their wish list of players down, you know, in the, in the summer, how many of these guys would have featured. But the, Arthur Boric was coming through as the number two international goalkeeper. Jersey Dudek, I think Liverpool would have, but, but, uh, by, by, the, by, the, by the following summer, which was a World Cup summer, Arthur Boric for me was one of the best goalkeepers in Europe. I think he was an outstanding goalkeeper. Yeah, I love the fact that he really got Celtic. I was lucky enough to be at a, a wee night ten days ago or so, and he still he came in and he, he said he said I can't believe basically 
paraphrasing, but I couldn't believe the love in the room after so many years. When we, but we, and I'm thinking, well, it would never be any different. So I thought, boy, it's a wonderful, wonderful character, a, a great goalkeeper. I, I guess probably the two best goalkeepers I've seen in, in Celtic jerseys all time for me, Fraser Forster just edges it. But for me, Arthur would be number two. Yeah, I don't think many folk would argue with that. Um, just in terms of your, your title characters, so Stan Petrov's still yes. fairly prominent. It was him and Arthur Boric doing that event you spoke of quite recently. We see him uh, on TV fairly frequently. Yep. As I mentioned earlier, Nakamura has just retired uh, back in Japan and we'll see what his next moves are to be. But whatever happened to Magic Zerowski, do you have any idea? I, I was trying to dig around and, and see what's what. I can't see any trace of the man. He did. He ended up back in yeah. He, en he ended up eventually back in Poland playing lower league. Where he is now, I, I couldn't say for sure. But he certainly finished his he finished his career in the, the same part of Poland that he that he came from. But again, a prolific. Maybe another guy perhaps doesn't get the credit. Magic and John, I think, for memory, t uh, they tied for sort of twenty goals. But bear in mind, John had been there. He'd been doing it year on year. But Magic came into that new team, and uh, again, you know, fitting on the same date in Fermland. Magic and, and the, so Magic and the King of Japan, they both scored their opening goals for Celtic. But he was he was a prolific he's a prolific goal scorer. Nakamura, as I say, we've touched on that. For me, Nakamura's genius. Any old time, you know, we often we were you know, kidding on around. What would your team be? What would your all time eleven be? What would your midfield be? Every time for me, he's in there. I just thought technically perfect. A bit like Lubo, a bit like Lubo. You just wish you'd had him. I think we only had him something like four years. Went to Espanol, never really. I know he. Play, I know he, in terms of his career, a lot of you know longevity. Longevity, if that's the word. But we. But I think we probably had Nakamura for the for the peak of his years a bit like a bit like Henrik and Stan as well. Stan it turned out it would turn out to be Stan Petrov's last season at Celtic before. Funny enough, he he did join Martin O'Neill at Aston Villa. Uh, but again, power the number of times and he did it year on year, didn't he? But again, particularly that time when these guys, I guess, took a wee bit additional mantle, a bit additional responsibility on the number of times Stan would go through and score the crucial one in goal or the opening goal or whatever. It's an, I thought I thought Petrov was an incredible talent, incredible midfield player. So, so come to illness and that didn't look great. And now watching him last night, uh, sorry, looking at him last week, he looked like he could still play. So did Arthur. They looked like they could still play. Guys that have looked after themselves. So. I remember being at the game, the, you know, Stan's game at Celtic Park with Aston Villa. It's, uh, sorry, with the Villa fans behind me. The, the game at Celtic Park, 60,000, and very, very emotional day. To see to see Stan now, that is really, really heartwarming. Looks looks 100%, I say. He looks as if he could pull in his boots and still do a turn for us. Yeah, amazing to see. Um, just talking about um, Zeravski's, you know, prolific, you know, goal return. There's a game that season, isn't there? We beat them fairly 8-1, and yes. he gets four of them. Uh, and also Lenny... Not prolific by any stretch. I think, has he got two goals for Celtic both at East End Park? Is there something bizarre? He's got, let me get this right, he's certainly got two East End, but I think, I think he's got three. You know, he'll, he'll kill me if he's got four, because Martin O'Neill once said when he, when he scored, well, that'll be we'll, we'll, we'll another goal in 2015 or something like that. But he certainly scored two, uh, he scored two at East End Park. He scored a fabulous chip into our end and into the Celtic end at Celtic Park against Hibs. Which is probably his best goal. I think I put something in the book along the obviously he was prolific at East End Park, two mm -hmm. goals and many appearances. But uh, yeah, like JFK moments, a bit like Danny McGrain, another one of my heroes. When Danny scored the goal, I remember Danny scoring the goal at Broth in 1973. Why do you remember that? Because he probably only scored five in about 600 games. So Lenny was the same, it wasn't his game, but I mean, he brought so many other things to the team. Remember, they, they brought him up from uh, Leslie, he's probably hitting 30 then. Absolute key component of, of, of uh, Martin O'Neill's great team Lennon and Lambert together Wonderful players And then there was a thing People were saying Lennon and uh, Neil Lennon and Roy Keane Can't play together Well I remember being at Ibrox I think it was February Of that year When I call them the Irish heartbeat They absolutely They could have played with their slippers They destroyed it And I think that ticked a box For Roy Keane I think he got a booking For putting Purcell about six feet in the air and Magic, of course, we've got one, we've got a couple of, it's a couple of fouls on Celtic players, and referee plays on. It's Mike McCurry. I'll just leave that one there. He plays, he plays on, and but that actually works for us because uh, Magic slots the ball in and goes. Celtic win, uh, Celtic win one, one, one nil. But my abiding memory of that game is the, as I say, the Irish heartbeat. They strolled through, and you can see them come off the park. It was like smoking cigars. So, so they said that Lennon and Lambert couldn't play together, Lennon and Keane couldn't play together. The reality is they absolutely could. Wonderful players can play with anybody. And good players can always find a way, yeah. can't they? Um, I was just wondering, just in terms of the title, did you have a bit of back and forth as to, you know, who to choose? There's so many figures. I, I've got an alternative for you, Matt. 
<laughs> Lenny Maloney and the Holy Goalie. No, <laughs> that's, just, work? that's a sequel. <laughs> uh, what made you go for these three out with you know the, the nice rhyme, which is great? But were these you know just key figures for you at that time? Well, absolutely, they're key figures. There's also a bit of, there's a bit of a nod to, to to a banner, which I think might have actually been at East End Park, where the, they've got the Japanese flag, and somebody's actually put it might actually be magic magic Jan and the King of Japan. But anyway, that, that sort of caught my imagination. One of the one of, one of the, the lads at Celtic Star books. That's his sort of forte, the titles and make sure if your titles if your titles good, you've got half a chance. So the minute the minute he suggested that, it's like yeah, that that's got to be it. So he played around slightly with it, but pretty much we've seen the banner, the King of Japan that that jumps out, Magic and Stan, key players. Yeah, that, that works for me. And the reaction we've had since we started talking about because you can pre-order the book now. The reaction we've had has suggested that we've got it right. It's catchy. Our, our designer has done a, a wonderful job, as you can see there, pulling the cover together. So I'm really, really excited to see it coming through. So, yeah, hopefully it's catchy. And thanks for plugging the sequel. I know, I know you need to go and write it. <laughs> no problem. But yeah, great title, great cover. And, uh, you know, and excited for the launch. We'll get to the detail, but the book launches uh, sure. next month on the 20th of October. But we'll, we'll get to all of that. Um, one thing I want to touch on, um, and it'd be remiss of me not to say, is Gordon Strachan's special relationship, but it certainly turned into a special relationship with Tommy Burns. So one of his first moves was to appoint him his first team coach. Gary Pendry um, was his long-serving number two, so he was the assistant manager, but he made Tommy Burns his, his first team coach. And there's a really good quote here I'd like to read out. So a couple of years later, Gordon Strachan was speaking at the Tommy Burns tribute match in May 2009, and this is just after he himself had resigned as manager. He says, I came here to be the Celtic manager, but I was lucky enough to become the best of friends with the nicest man I've ever met in my life. We had some great times at this club over the last four years. We had smashing European nights, we won championships and did great things together. Tommy helped me more than anybody. If it hadn't been for Tommy, my life wouldn't have been as funny as it was and we wouldn't have had as much success as we did. And that in itself, Matt, just sums up exactly where, where those two guys were at. They weren't teammates, you know, they weren't particularly friendly over the years from what I'm led to believe. But as soon as they started working together, something just clicked. I mean, I don't, I don't really have words for that. That's, that, that's an outstanding comment. And not, not being friends, I guess, when we're playing days is probably being kind because I'd have talk, talk, certainly around 1981-82 when Tommy was at his, for me, his absolute peak. He should have, for me, he should have went to, 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 to uh, Spain and the, the World Cup and the jock that year. So there were rivals for position. There was no typical two redheads, very fiercely combat, uh, combative. They were constantly niggling at one another. So it's probably the most unlikely friendship. But you know of... I guess of the Gordon Strachan era, I think that I think that's probably the nicest thing. And I think if you would ask Gordon of everything he had, which is pretty much what he's saying there, I guess, isn't it? Of, of everything he had over that four years, what did he treasure most? It's not trophies, is it? It's the the fact that he got to meet he got to meet Tommy. I've, I've heard similar quotes, but I mean that that's outstanding. Yeah, yeah, it's a great quote, and and it's very sincere. And and there's video footage of Gordon Strachan speaking shortly after Tommy Burns has passed. And it's, it's very emotional to see, but it's so sincere and it's so genuine. And it's clear that, like with, I think, most people he touched, Tommy Burns meant so much to him. And it's it's just really heartwarming to see that. Yeah. Um, as we start to kind of close things out, Matt, I also just want to ask about Gordon Strachan, the personality. You know, really successful football guy, you know, big success at Aberdeen and at Man United and all that kind of stuff before his, his managerial career. Obviously, this the book focuses on the 2005-06 season, but we don't only won three trophies, three league trophies in succession for Celtic, two league cups, Scottish Cup, last 16 of the Champions League twice, you'd bite the hand off for something like that nowadays given how we're currently performing Champions League wise. Yep. Huge success at Celtic but as I touched on at the start, I think it's fair to say that he's not hugely revered by some quarters of the, the support. So how do you think he should be remembered at Celtic? Well I do, I, I do think that I do think that's changing and, and it goes back to an earlier comment I made on maybe another personality talks about the invincible season and do you remember Fergus McCann being booed as we unfold the league flag? Yes. So I do I do think that history will be much kinder to Gordon's time and I guess we're talking history now isn't it? It's 15 years ago it's 15 years and more since I came here so I do think history will be much kinder I think most folk now being objective there was a lot of hurt at the time we talked about the disastrous start we talked about Gordon's background. I say certainly not a certainly not a Celtic background. If anything, you could have argued that Gordon was somebody who in tag. There was two two fan attacks on Gordon as players that I remember, quite horrendous. But so that there was this isn't wasn't an ordinary appointment. So I think a lot of those factors combined. Gordon had uh, had a sharp wit, 
and like like all popular people, all all successful people, you know, you can divide opinion as well. If you're looking at when you've just outlined, you know, it's quite incredible. After Bratislava, for your next two seasons to be, you know, battling in the San Siro. I remember being in the San Siro when Kaká scored the only goal for the team that went on to win the Champions League. You know, you're right. If you compare and contrast it with with less resources, perhaps, and no, perhaps less resources than Martin, with minus Henrik Larsson, it's. It's, in terms of achievements, for me, it's right up there. But you know, people will make their own judgments. But if you're asking for my opinion, what Gordon Strachan achieved in his tenure at Celtic is outstanding. That's the word for me, outstanding. Yeah, and and I think history will in due course, and maybe now is time, you know, for for that to happen. Look kindly on on everything he achieved. And I suppose it's just it's a footballing phenomenon. You know, you spoke about Fergus McCann. You're absolutely right. There's an example I touched on earlier on with Lenny as well. Yes, in, in years yes. to come. People might think it's incredible that Neil Lennon ever get a hard time because you'll just look at his trophy record as player and manager and you'll say, How could you possibly not credit this guy for what he achieved? Of course, there's going to be bumps in the road, there's going to be failures, but I, I kind of think you don't have the success without the failure. It's all part of the story, isn't it? Oh. And it'll very much be the case for, for Gordon Strachan. But least of all, you know, the, the, the very season we're talking about, the ups and downs, the two Bs that you mentioned. Losses, Dunfermline, all sorts of stuff going on, but just a, a huge roller coaster, but ultimately a hugely successful season. It brings us on to the book launch, Matt. So, obviously, exciting time for yourself. You know, I had, this is your third solo book we've mentioned. Um, 20th of October, so we're recording here just now, late September, so not far off a month. And it's an event at Celtic Park. I know there's lots more details to follow and things to be confirmed, but can you just give us a wee bit of information on that at the moment? Well, that's right. We're, we're, we're sort of Try to iron out a few details. Now it will be at Celtic Park, and it will be in that date. Uh, and I think what we're trying to do is, we're trying to, we're certainly trying to honour that season. But hopefully, we're going to, we're going to honour, we're going to recognise a few other things as well. But I'm, I'm loath to, uh, I'm loath to say too much more until we've got a definite detail. And but uh, we're, we're trying to do the right thing by a, by a few folk. I'll just leave it at that. Yep. And what to do? You keep a close eye on our socials as well as Matt's. I'll link to Matt's uh, Twitter account. Very active on Twitter. Lots of good stuff from Matt. Uh, so I'll link to that uh, in the show notes for this episode and you'll find out all the details in due course. But one for the diary, Friday 20th October at Celtic Park, the launch event for the new book. Matt, just at the moment, you'd mentioned something about pre-launch, so how can folk get their hands on the book either in advance of the 20th or on the 20th itself? Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've been taking pre-orders now for a few days. That's going really well. So you, you can pre-order the book, signed, personalised, whichever you fancy. That's at celticstarbooks.com forward slash shop. So you can you can you can, you can pre-order your copy now for that, and by the twentieth we'll make sure that's all ready and shipped out on that day for you. Perfect. So as you can imagine, Matt, I've, I've read through large parts of the manuscripts as you know part of my research for today. It's just such a well-told story, and I wonder. I don't know for sure. You can maybe tell me if you've just picked up on on one of David Potter's skills in terms of taking folk right back to that moment in time. And what what I really like about the book is, of course, it's about that season two thousand and five and six and where you were at the various times and what happened. But you also reference other times in your Celtic support life. You mentioned, you know, something from the 70s when you were just a young man and various different games. And it just takes you to the, these snapshots in Celtic life. So most of us, I'm pretty sure all of us listening at the moment, um, well, have experienced that season, you know, not that long ago, maybe 17 years or so ago. But there's also different snapshots in Celtic's history. And is that one of your challenges, Matt, to, to place the reader, you know, in that time in Celtic history? Well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, firstly, there's, on, there's only one David Potter, but if, if he's teaching us anything, that's that, that that's great news. So, so yeah, in all of the books I've done, we've, we've tried to take that element. There's a bit about, uh, and we've got good feedback for the early books. It said, you know, it's not just a a blow by blow. It's a, it's a blow by blow account of the season. Absolutely, the details in there, but it, but hopefully, the Celtic story is always much more than that. You you try to introduce that personal element. It brings a history. You know, it brings a lot of memories in, and the, the key thing about that is folk can relate to it. So I might be talking about my dad, as you say, something that happened in the seventies or whatever, eh, or, or or my kids in the in the you know in the, in the modern Celtic, and folk will come back and say that was exactly the same for me. Or I had an uncle so and so, and he did that. So it, it's not accidental. When I'm writing the story, then we get the framework. The framework is the season, but then there's so much to work on around that to try and make the book enjoyable, informative and ultimately to be meaningful to folk who are, who are reading it. If, it if, if you read that, Tino, and it, it strikes a chord with you, I've succeeded. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I see it. Yeah, it absolutely does. And just as we're, as we're closing things out, Matt, I suppose I was going to ask any kind of final comments on the season in general, you know, your hopes for the book. But I believe there's also a, an epilogue towards a true Celtic hero in Henrik Larson. <laughs> 
yeah, okay. Spoiler alert coming up, but uh, yeah, absolutely. It, as I said, I've talked about so many different things happened that season, and there's another wee twist right at the end of the season, which I suspect through the passage of time, most folk will have forgotten about, and, uh, and I guess it, it involves the, the greatest Celtic player I've ever seen. So I'll just probably leave that and that. Some people refer to him as the King of Kings or Henrik or, or whatever, but there's a, there's a lovely wee sting. There's a lovely wee twist in the tale right at the end involving Henrik, but I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Perfect, I'm happy for that. Matt, all that's left really is for me to you know, thank you again for coming on the Celtic Exchange. You're a regular feature now in that chair, so I'm sure we'll see in the, the years ahead as the is the, the volume of books that you write, you know, increases. But great to have you in today. Um, thanks to yourself and also to the various authors. You know, I, I listened to your own tribute. You were on the Graham Spears podcast recently talking about David Potter. And yourself and Matthew Marr, another Celtic author, were speaking about just how important it is to continue to tell these stories. David, as you touched on, mentioned or, or told the story of Alec McNair, the icicle, and, and guys who would have been lost to history. Yes. And I think it's so important the work that yourself and Matthew and the modern day are doing to keep alive these stories and you know Gordon Strachan's a recent story but you know as mentioned there's a volume that you're already starting to create which tells these great stories so finally very best of luck you know of course with the book I've no doubt it'll be a success and I look forward to seeing you at next month's launch that's really really kind Tino I thoroughly enjoyed it thank you <laughs>